Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct consumer marketing world. Welcome to the second event of our Fall 2022 seminar series today, created by the PDMI's e-commerce council, Attribution for E-commerce Campaigns. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you are not a PDMI member but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the, the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of the industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our latest PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. Another housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. You know, as e-commerce and digital marketing evolves and as changes in consumer expectations force performance marketers to evolve with it, what are the latest innovations helping those marketers understand sales attribution for their campaigns? Privacy concerns, Google's continually delayed removal of cookies from the data batch, and Apple's iOS changes have all made the marketer's job even harder. Today, PDMI eCommerce Council Chairman Gregory Silvano, CEO of Biased, is here to host a conversation about these topics and more. Joining him today are Alex Nazarevich, Vice President of Growth Marketing for Leeds RX, an unbounced company, and Brian Rolf, a leader in the Direct to Consumer Division of Spectrum Brands. Thanks to each of you for joining us. Greg, take it away. Thank you very much, Tom. All right, so we're going to start with the basics here. We're talking about attribution. We're talking about attribution specific to e-commerce. Right, so that's the topic. Alex, what does that mean? Right, what is what is attribution related to to e the e-commerce world? Yeah, uh, fundamentally, attribution is meant to answer the age-old marketing question of I know I'm wasting half of my marketing budget, but the question is which half. So, essentially, trying to help you figure out where your traffic is coming from. Um, and then where it's going, i.e. who's converting into um, sales and impacting your bottom line. So in doing that, so we we spend a bunch of money, let's say we spend $100,000 in a month and some of that might be on TV, some of that might be on Facebook, it could be on YouTube, it could be email campaigns, right? So money's coming from, from everywhere. And sure, that might result in a million dollars in sales, but it doesn't mean it's all winning, right? Some could be losing, some could be winning. By doing this attribution, right? So you have to to know what's working and what's not working, and specifically what's not working, so you can certainly optimize that, but also what's working, so maybe you could double down on that. Do you learn about the customers as well during this, right? That kind of customer journey, because it's it's not not as simple as oh they clicked a Facebook ad and and simply you know bought something. Yeah, absolutely. So um, learning about who your customer is and the journey that they take from awareness of your brand initially uh, to conversion and then hopefully retention and maximizing their lifetime value is a critical question that you try to answer um, with, with any attribution tool. Um, attribution started out understanding, you know, what is the most efficient channel to get the next sale as you scale your marketing budget up? How do you make the case to spend more, uh, to drive more sales? But where that leads you um, and where, you know, where it should lead you is, who is the customer and what really makes them tick and uh, what content is most effective at every stage of the funnel um, to help them move to the next stage. What are so the, that's what, absolutely a big part of it. What are the stages? Are there, are there just set terms for some of these stages or are kind of different per campaign or per client? It'll kind of differ per person. I mean, the, the general ones are, you know, sort of this awareness stage. Do they, are they aware? Yeah, awareness could go as high as, are they aware that there's even a problem to solve um, if you're selling? So, you know, in, in one of my previous roles, I was VP of Growth at Indochino. So does it cut, is the customer aware that they need a, a men's suit? Um, and then moving down the funnel from there um, to sort of competitive selection. And like, am I aware that Indochino is a brand that sells men's suits? Um, and then down to conversion, which is I bought the suit, retention, I'm going to come back and buy another one. Um, so, you know, at Leaser X, fundamentally, that's the question that we try to answer for, for customers across all sorts of different brands. Got it. Brian. Uh, I'm going to, same question, just in case there's anything to add, maybe you don't have anything to add on that, but you know, we're talking about attribution. What, what is that? Right. Um, anything to add to it? Yeah, I think Alex covered most of it, but I, I would add, you know, just finding where your customers are coming from and also the touch points along the way. So, you know, you might be using like, for example, TikTok real top of funnel to just get, get that ad, get that product in front of the user's eyes, but you might not convert them there and they might convert down the funnel. And that might mean they go on Facebook the next day. And they end up clicking through an ad and converting 
Now you have a two touch point kind of customer journey and you're able to kind of tie those things back together and understand, you know, where they're shopping, where their journey is taking place and you can double down if it's working. And like you said, Greg, if something's not working, you can pull back and, and kind of pour that those ad dollars into something that's a little bit more efficient. So it's funny. Um, I've always had in my head that the the term customer journey is just yet another, you know, term that somebody throws in like a job description or something. Is it a meaningful thing? Is it a real term that I just need to accept as something that uh, people are, it's a legit marketing term, customer journey? I think we're there. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> it's, it's a done deal. Okay. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to have you keep answering this one because um, it, it leads into where I was heading on, on the next question and you just brought it up. Uh, when I understand it, I'm not a marketer, right? So when I think of attribution and I'm exposed to attribution, but I never, you know, actually participate in the, the details of it. I've heard terms like last click model and, you know, first touch or last touch or multi-touch and things like that. Um, are those all still relevant? Is that is one taking over, right? But I know those terms from years and years ago. Um, how's that kind of, you know, played out? Yeah, I definitely think those terms are very much still relevant. Um, you know, if you were every brand wants to win on a last click basis, meaning that they click di directly from their ad and converted from there. But Why? You know, Why? All the, because it's just simpler. Or? It's well, yeah, it's simpler. Yeah, you don't have to tie things back as far. It's more efficient because you're modeling your data off a shorter window. But you know, as iOS kind of dropped, and then obviously the cookie issues with Google, you know, we have to look deeper than that. So we might see there are a couple of platforms specifically that we run you know, for our media stack that are more of discovery channels and really are view through. So people seeing an ad, but maybe not purchasing right then and there. And that's a YouTube, that might be a TikTok, that might be affiliate, that might be a podcast. And then things that are more last click driven are your Google shopping ads, your Facebook ads, um, you know, maybe, you know, your search, your SEO, things of that nature, where people are seeing your brand from one channel, from being on YouTube. And then the next day, they're going to search it on Google, cl clicking through a Google shopping ad and converting. So it's re I think it's really important as we move forward and we're getting less data back to really understand all right, where are these people seeing us for the first time and then what are the actual channels that are closing the deal and getting the deal done. Great. Alex, anything to add to that? I mean, yes to all of the above. Um, and it, also, I would say this. Outside of the immediate marketing function, it gets more and more difficult to explain um, how crucial each channel can be. Uh, not only in terms of converting more customers and translating that to sales, but from an awareness standpoint. So Brian really touched on that about there are some channels that are just better um, for, build, for building that awareness and audience engagement further up the funnel. But that's difficult to explain maybe to like maybe to the finance team, for example. So if you're using a multi-touch attribution model, if you're looking further back into the customer journey, you can explain using data. Um, what we know intuitively to be true, which is that customers will become aware of our brand in a given channel um, and maybe convert to a different one. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's hit the the elephant in the room. You both touched upon it in, in kind of what you're describing uh, in your earlier answers. You touched upon the subject. Something happened last year, right? 2021, there was a, uh, a change that impacted your ability to do your job. I'll, I'll have Brian go first here. What was that change? Yeah, so I believe April 2021. Yeah, you know, another month. Yeah, <laughs> month. I think it was around the 14th. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> Apple came out with iOS 14.5. That basically gave Apple users, which are a majority of us, obviously on mobile, the the ability to kind of opt out of tracking. So you know that's a really big bold statement right there. And they wanted to give you know put privacy in the hands of their users, which takes it away from big tech like Google and our and our TikTok, Snapchats, Facebooks, YouTube. So Basically, what that update update did overnight was completely rock the marketing and D2C specifically landscape and the ecosystem of our. We were tracking things pretty fine tuned previously. Now we're we're getting a real sense of a gap in that data. What are we going to do now fundamentally to you know repatch what they have done to the pretty much the entire industry? So you had a you know a gluttony of data for years. You know, so people are are on Facebook because of the data that they could get from their their audience, right? And and poof, it goes away. And I think, if I remember correctly, um, iOS had the ability to do it before 14.5, but it was not the default was to opt out. And I think iOS 14.5 made it the default where you had to opt in instead yeah. of opting out. If if I remember correctly, I could actually could be wrong. Um, so data Armageddon, I mean, so Alex, you kind of, I'll have you take over from there. How big, you know, there was a lot of chatter about that before. 
did it yeah. really become the data Armageddon that uh, people thought it was going to be? Yeah, I think we all remember where we were at uh, in our businesses that month with the uh, <laughs> iOS update that was felt around the marketing world. I would say, you know, it it uh, it hit us hard on acquisition. Suddenly, you had a significant chunk. Anybody who was on um, on an Apple device that, that was updated, you can no longer track um, the vast vast majority of of them from an acquisition standpoint. Um, and in some ways, it hurt oh, it as much or even more. Yeah. Hold on a second before you keep going. So, yeah. what do you mean by on the acquisition standpoint? So, so let's say before iOS right. fourteen point five, let's go through a customer journey here. I yeah, saw sure. a, an ad somewhere, or I saw a Facebook ad, and I went to a website. Like, how did it work in March, and then how did it work in June? The same scenario. What what happened? Yep. So essentially, um, before this update, if you were on an, you know. An Apple, like say you're on your iPhone and you and you updated it. Previously, there was all this third-party cookie data uh, that was following you around the internet. It wasn't necessarily data. It certainly wasn't anything that you had consented to. But your information um, is being collected by the apps you use, the websites you visit, um, and then shared around via, say, something as simple as like the Facebook like button, which is pretty ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, the you know the iOS, iOS update changed all that. So. Essentially, instead of having a, a look far, far back into a customer's past, where they came from, the touch points they interacted with, up to the point of conversion, uh, you lost a lot of that. You know, that wasn't um, strictly speaking first-party cookie data. And then on the other side, after you've got them in your email database, um, after they maybe may have purchased something and interacted with your brand, it hits you on the conversion or on the um, retention side too. So, say you send an email, anyone opening it on their iPhone in March. You would see how they opened it, how they clicked it. In June, um, you would see what looked like 100% open rate, 100 all links clicked because um, the uh, the update essentially essentially pre-opened and pre-clicked all the links in the e marketing emails you sent out. It's impossible to track. It's really devious um, oh, in terms of how to in terms of how to track um, in email metrics. So it left you relying on where you know basically the last click that you saw from them coming into your website. Did it hit all types of m digital marketing equally? I'll let Brian Brian go on this one. Um, and I don't know if I'm wording this correct this this correctly, but you mentioned email, right? And then we talked about Facebook. We talked about you know um, uh, retargeting or acquisitions versus retention. Um, was everything just blanket affected the same way, or were some of them completely blown out of the water, while others were just kind of moderately affected? Yeah, I think any software or platform that really heavily relied on its pixels specifically got hit the hardest. And that's the Facebooks, the TikToks, the Snapchats um, and, and things of that nature. You know, things like, you know, direct response TV and maybe something else where you measure it a little bit differently and look at like incremental lists and using MER and things like that. You can kind of get away from it because there wasn't pixels to begin with on those channels. But anything that's related to like pixels in the back end, tracking user journey, user actions on your website or even on their platform those got absolutely devastated but to alex's point from top down from cold prospecting channel like tv all the way down through email and retention everything got hammered pretty you know not not at the same rate but hammered enough i feel like you guys have ptsd right now i'm sorry for bringing this up <laughs> um working right. through it yeah exactly all right so I think we've set the stage. I, I wanted to spend about 15 minutes kind of going through what what happened, you know, what life was like and what is it we're talking about, what happened. And then I want to talk about what's what's kind of changed since then. Right. So now, it's, you know, where are we now and where are we heading in the future for the rest of this? So I think this is this is going you know perfectly. So let's talk about the post apocalypse. Uh, has the dust settled? Is there a, a new normal? And if so, what is that that new normal? I love Alex, go first. Or Brian, don't, actually, either, doesn't matter. Um, I can jump in. I think that I think the dust is still settling. And I, w I would say that, you know, Apple making the decision to put customers' data privacy options into their own hands, I think the people voted. And it was an overwhelming, we want control of our data. And you can see this in legislation around the world, which I think we'll probably get into a bit later. Um, so the dust is still settling. As yeah. a brand, is probably important to know, right? Your customers don't yeah. want you doing this, yeah. so you know we we're brand driven, right? So that's exactly it. Like I think that um, we've had some time to process, and you know, still still going through it. But but the fact of the matter remains: um, customers have said loud and clear that they don't want to be marketed to this way. They don't want us using their data in that way. So how do we get better at serving customers in the way they want to be served? Um, and to some degree, it comes back to what's old is new again. Channels that may have previously been 
being less easy to to justify using uh, we have to get better we have to get better at using the data from that and incorporating it into the customer journey uh conversely channels that are, where we've always had these mountains of data facebook ads um TikTok kind of you know came along relatively late to game so we had it for a bit there um you know display media in general i would say anything through social platforms is um it is a has a bit of a shine taken off because you just can't target quite as accurately as as you could before right so so the point there being that we you had these these you know sources of traffic that we had in the past let's just say tv i mean it's pretty pretty ubiquitous <laughs> in our industry um and then people gravitate towards these Facebooks and digital marketing platform, uh, digital platforms, because of the trove of data that you have. And now that that's gone, or you know, certainly some, you know, cut back a bit, um, it, it kind of puts the the original ones back in in play. Maybe right? Is that is that where you're heading on that? Yeah, exactly. So with so the, um, I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at it. I think I think relatively speaking, so these traditional channel, channels, that's exactly it. They're they they were never any worse or better than they'd always been in terms of us on having an understanding of who we were targeting through them. But relatively speaking, now there's just they just become a little bit more important because relative to some of these other channels, they've got they they look better by comparison. Um, but part of it too is I, I think that for some time we were able to we were able to coast on this, maybe surf on this tsunami of data that that was coming at us. I think we've all had the experience where we purchased something online. Um, I bought a pair of boots a couple of weeks ago. I won't mention the brand, but I bought the pair of boots and then the ads followed me around the, the internet for one or two weeks after them. Like I bought them, they were $300. I'm not gonna buy another pair immediately. Um, and there was a lot of that, I think, in the heyday of, of third party cookie data. There was so much we could do. It was just plastering customers with this information. So um, getting away from that, that ubiquitous, hit them with everything you've got and just be very clear about what is the customer journey and what gap are you filling in? What objection are you answering at each stage of the funnel to facilitate them moving to the next stage? Which could actually benefit us, right? Us being people in, in D2C, it means, it means we all have to do our jobs and we can't just get you know sloppy because the, it's easy to kind of do that shotgun approach, right? When you, when you, when you don't have that type of data, you have to actually plan a lot better, right? Otherwise, yeah. you waste yeah. a lot of money. Um, so the the question there, Brian, was, um, you know, has the dust settled, right? So after 2021 iOS, um, you know, we're we're almost done with 2022. Is there a new new normal for what you see, you know, with the the product type branding um, uh, attribution that you do for the campaigns that you um, support? Is there a new normal for you? Are you getting into a routine now that this just kind of, it's just new normal? I don't know how else yeah. to say it. Yeah, exactly. So I think leading up to, you know, April, you know, 2021 going back, everyone was, you know, this is the doom and gloom that's coming. Everyone knew it was coming in April at some day. You know, we knew it was around mid-April, but not exact day. So the whole, of you know, January, February, March, everyone's kind of panicking. This is the end of D2C. This is the end of growth marketing. And you know, it came and it wasn't as bad as I think we all thought it would be. It was a devastating blow, but it wasn't the the end all be all. Lucky and now you fast, yeah, yeah, lucky, lucky us. And then fast forward a year from now, I think it really did change the way not only we do our marketing, um, it, ca it caused us to simplify things inside channels, consolidate things and really take an MER approach. Because when you don't have that fine tune exact number or data, point to each channel and how it is affecting your business, you have to take a step back and look at it holistically saying, you know, we're spending here, we're spending on this channel X, X, Y, and Z, what's our revenue and kind of pulling, pulling those strings a little bit differently. Whereas, you know, pre iOS, you can kind of pretty much say exactly how many purchases came from Facebook, exactly how many came from Google. And it's not the way it is anymore. So the dust has settled. I think it's, it hasn't gotten much easier, but it's become the new normal, like you said. And I think we're more comfortable driving these boats kind of in this landscape. Whereas, you know, before it, it was a lot of worry and no one was really sure how hard it was going to hit and exactly what we're, we were going to be able to do post, you know, post its release. Does the, thank you. Um, the new normal, the new world post iOS 14.5, um, the lack of data that you used to have, 
are there tools now? Are there platforms that have helped kind of you know mitigate that? I mean, help you do your job that uh, might pull things together in ways that it didn't do before? I think you both mentioned that you've used them in kind of how you answered other questions. Um, Brian, I'll, I'll have you start there. Do you use a platform that helps with data modeling for attribution? Yeah, so we decided to go with a platform called Northbeam, and it's exactly that. It kind of helps us get a better insight into our marketing efforts and attribution itself. So it's not just relying on one tool, right? We kind of, like you know, Alex said, I think we all got a little lazy when data was so clean and clear, um, and we kind of had to take a step back and really dive in. So between you know using things like Google Analytics, um, using another third-party tool, a software attribution system, and then your your own storefront, whether it's you know a bias or something like or Mojo or something like that you're able to kind of take all three and really gut check your numbers. So I absolutely do think it's vital to use a tool because there's so much benefit that comes from it, not only from an attribution standpoint, but also the customer journey and see the touch points it takes to actually convert a customer. So I can't imagine not using one in this landscape. Um, and I rec I highly recommend using, you know, they're all really good and, you know, there's different purposes for each one, but I recommend getting one, kind of learning it and really bringing it into your daily, your, your, your daily job and, and, and leaning on it as much as you can. Um, every platform has its own attribution, right? I mean, Facebook has its own, Shopify has its own, uh, you have Google obviously has its own, TikTok has its own. What does a tool like this do? And actually, I'm gonna stick with Brian for a second because uh, Alex, I'm gonna have you answer the exact same question. Um, what what does the tool do? I mean, why can't you just go into Facebook and see what it does? Why can't you just go into Google Analytics? And and does Google Analytics do any of this? I've always thought of Google Analytics as this you know agnostic thing that's out there and and kind of aggregating lots of things that happen. Um, what would something like like Northbeam add to the equation? Yeah, so I believe Alex will touch on this maybe even a bit better, but I believe GA runs on a one-day click, so it's losing attribution that happens after one day. Um, so that that could be a seven-day click, or even you know Facebook used to run on a huge window. I think it was twenty-eight day view, seven-day click. Now it's seven-day view, one-day click. So they or, sorry, every order attributed click. to them. Yeah, yeah. So they shorten the window, the conversion window. But basically, what it does, it's I believe it's collecting data as a first party because it's not using it for advertising purposes, whereas Facebook and TikTok and other big tech companies are, cannot use the data and then act on it and, then app and make money off advertising. So these, these softwares, these tools are not here to collect your data and then run ads to a, you know, an audience or a user list from it. It's for, you to, it's for them to collect the data as a first party, give you the guidance and the data that you are not getting post iOS 14 and then making your fundamental decisions on media buying and marketing and advertising using the data that they're, they're providing you. Have, do you have any uh, examples of a time that uh, maybe a particular channel didn't look very good before the, you know, yeah. looking at their own data and then you use this tool and all of a sudden, hey, wait, or, or the other way around, maybe that, that platform made itself look really good and then you... you... Yeah, I think the shiny new toy in D2C is obviously TikTok. You know, it's definitely one of the most popular platforms, but their, their ad platforms itself is so premature in comparison to a Facebook, um, a Google and things like that. So... Most brands, when running conversion-based campaigns, which is what we're all after, right, in D2C for the most part, is getting that conversion. The numbers just didn't justify it. You know, you would have really low CPMs. You'd be able to reach a ton of people, but getting them to actually see an ad on TikTok, come through and buy, if you're using TikTok's in-platform numbers, you might see CPAs, you know, if your CPA goal is 100 bucks, you might see like 500. Obviously, that's very unprofitable. You're, you're losing $400, you know, a conversion. Then when you get into one of these tools and you're able to collect data from a different POV, that number looks a lot better. So instead of $500 CPAs in, tech, in TikTok, we were seeing $150 CPAs through the tool. So that says, yeah. hey, for our brand, wow, like TikTok's giving us data that is not really making a whole lot of sense. Just when we were about to take money away from TikTok and maybe put right. it back in Facebook, we're saying, whoa, 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 let's kind of use this a discovery channel. Let's kind of put more money here because our CPA is not as far off as we once thought it was. So that that's the number one thing. I think TikTok, it helped us unleash scale on TikTok that I don't think we probably would have been able to do without it. That's wild. All right, Alex, all the same stuff over to you. Now, obviously you are with Unbounce and Leads RX, right? And Leads RX is one of these platforms, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna assume you have plenty to talk about here. Um yeah, same sure. question, you know, are there platforms that that uh, help with your job of of doing data attribution? Um, talk to me about Leads RX. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, to the surprise of no one, I absolutely use LeadsRx in my day-to-day -day work. Um, and the idea with, a, like, let me back up a step. With the death of third-party data, 
um, we need to rely more than ever on a couple things. First of all, first party data. What do you have in your CRM? What in customer info do you have that they've consented for you to use for marketing purposes or to learn more about what your audience looks like? Um, take that and put it together with all the other channels that, that you advertise in, which have their own, you know, in-app data you can use, and you get a really complete picture, as complete a picture of the marketing funnel as you're ever going to get in this day and age. So whatever tool you end up going with, make sure you're picking one that allows you to integrate multiple multiple data sources, integrate your own customers' first-party data, add in, you know, um, like logs from, you know, from radio spots, TV spots, whatever channel you may be working with to get a really complete picture. Um, I would say that in the past couple of years, even before iOS gate happened, um, it, it was getting harder and harder to deal with the preponderance of different of different measurement systems, like slightly inconsistent pieces. Um, you know, Brian, as you said, Facebook switching from the 28 day look back to the seven day look back was just, you know, completely yeah. changed. Uh, you know, it just changed overnight, like the way, the way that you that you looked at data in platform. And then it, each platform gives you one specific view, even factoring out whether or not that view may be slightly optimized or maybe putting like the best positive spin on what that platform is delivering you as an advertiser. It's exhausting to look in Facebook, in TikTok, in Google, everywhere. You need one platform that aggregates all your data and puts together in like a cohesive customer story. That's the only way that you'll get someone outside of the marketing function to understand. And frankly, like even within the marketing function, it's the only way as a marketing leader to understand which channels are driving which parts of the funnel. So that was a very, a very long way of saying you need, yeah, you need a, a data attribution platform to sit on top of the plethora of other data that you have there to bring up one unified view. When when does it make sense to have one of these? I mean, is it uh, when you're an enterprise, when you're a small business, when you're one person with a product and you got some Facebook ads? You know, is there a point where it just kind of makes sense to do it? Is it based on the sources of traffic? Where you're, where you're it's not about on? the size of your company necessarily. It's about the sophistication of your marketing funnel. If you are a business that sells only through Instagram and like that's like all you're doing is is running is running ads on Instagram and you sell through Instagram and you do live sales on Instagram, then you're probably not going to need a marketing attribution software uh, to support you with that. But most companies in this day and age have other parts. You've got your you've got your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, your and then further down the funnel, you've got your email and retention like marketing efforts that you have, maybe an SMS blast that will go out. You need to be able, if you want to stitch all these together into a customer journey, you need a marketing att attribution platform like this. And they all work with a CRM, <clears throat> right? To me, when I think of digital marketing, I think of buying mm -hmm. ads somewhere, right? And it's a, it's mm -hmm. what's ingrained in my head. Um, but the reality is somebody could have an ad up on Facebook and they get to my website, they sign up for a newsletter and it goes into Klaviyo or whatever CRM is, uh, whatever CRM is being used and a few emails go out and then they buy something. I would imagine knowing, I forget how I started, that was a Facebook ad. I would imagine yeah. knowing that that Facebook ad resulted in a subscriber that then, you know, after a few emails actually bought something, it means something for that Facebook ad. I mean, you know, enough Facebook ads doing that, it might be a longer sale, but it's a, it's meaningful data. Um, so you had mentioned the whole first party data. Um, mm -hmm. Brian, going, I'm gonna ask you to answer this question. This is off the cuff here, so. Um, is the CRM ever more important nowadays? Like, is that a is that a big part of campaigns? Is kind of like your existing customers and managing that in the CRM and having that as part of this? Yeah, I think absolutely. Especially, listen, if you're a brand with like a single hero product and that's all you sell, you know, you're not relying on CRM as much and retention because people came and bought and they're probably not coming back. And there's, you know, there's a lot of those in this industry, but in the in the broader scheme of D2C. You know, the big brands that have catalogs of 5, 10, 15, 20 products, sometimes 1,000. You, you need, that's an absolute staple point. I don't think there's ever been more effort put in on the retention and CRM kind of focus of the business because you know that in tough times, like in a tough macro headwind like we are and I, we're at right now, if you can rely on your, your you know, retention practices and your bottom of funnel and some of the, your, you know, your owned customers already, you're able to kind of market to them less, uh, more cost effectively. You're able to keep them longer and build out their LTV. So it, I don't think there's ever been more of a focus. I think that was one of the big things with us. We really doubled down on email like two years ago. We want to make email a big part of our business. We want to make it 15% of our overall online revenue. And we took steps to do that. And that might, you know, that we use Klaviyo. So that's building out email flows. 
understanding if people buy this product, they're probably gonna buy, buy product C. Maybe if they bought product B, they're probably not gonna buy product D. So just understanding kind of your customers is very, very important. And the one thing you do own, you know, it's, Apple took a lot from us, but the one thing you do own is your customer list and, and, and you know, that loyalty with your customers. So you really wanna maximize not only their perception of your brand, but their loyalty, because if they can keep coming back over years and years and build up that LTV, you know, it really helps the business um, thrive in the long term. I mean, it's the textbook answer of why D to C exists, right? You you want the direct, you know, direct consumer. You want that customer to be your own. So, um, brings me to a, to an Amazon question. Something we actually didn't uh, talk about earlier. You know, kind of you buy something on Amazon, and and you know, you are Amazon's customer, right? That's not a, a D to C environment. How do do I, any platforms or any solutions or any anything? Uh, you know, how does how does Amazon fit into your modeling? I mean, if you run a com commercial on Discovery Channel, you're going to get Amazon sales. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. How does what do you do there? Either can take it or either can say no. I'm not answering that. <laughs> Amazon is a weird one. I think that you know, in the past, Amazon was a little more generous with the data that they shared, and it made it a lot easier to have this omni omni channel model that Amazon was a part of. More and more, they're kind of following this walled garden model where um, it's more difficult to understand uh, not only the, you know, the personally identifying demographics of the of the people who are shopping for your product, but then the the breadth and depth of data that you're able to take out of that and export is basically nothing now. So um, Amazon is pretty aggressively driving themselves as, you know, as a funnel through which you you want to drive your business. Um, yeah, honestly, that's not one that I, I know that there's a good answer to at this point in terms of, of stitching it into your bigger marketing ecosystem. That's kind of my opinion. Yeah, I think for us, we kind of what we did was we do know, like, you know, like Greg, as you mentioned, when we're running at scale on something like TV or Facebook, we do know there's a trickle or, or halo effect on our Amazon revenue. So we just did the old school of look at incremental lift. The weeks that we're not running at that scale, what are our numbers? If we bump up budgets by, you know, 2x, what is that incremental lift on Amazon? It kind of what we did was we kind of took it and took our Amazon numbers and baked it into our D2C P&L. And just to show that there is a halo effect and what we found that every brand's different, obviously, whether even on Amazon, your offers are much different between your D2C site and your Amazon site, all that stuff plays a role. But we've seen at scale, we usually get a 10 to 15% halo effect off our spends to Amazon, uh, Amazon revenue. So that's just one of the stable point numbers. It's not exact, but we can justify that, hey, if we're gonna spend a million dollars this quarter, on this item, we should expect a 10% lift on Amazon revenue from the percentage of spend um, that we're attributing our D2C budgets to. So there's no clear answer. You know, there's affiliate links on Amazon. There's like attribution links that we've done for like Prime Day and I've used in Facebook, but it's never going to be one to one. I um, mean, just kind of it's one of those things that if you're going to be selling on Amazon, um, you kind of have to just roll with the punches in terms of you're not going to get the cleanest picture. You really just kind of have to look at MER and kind of look at that incremental lift. It's funny because it, it goes right back to what Alex said earlier, uh, way earlier, when he was like, you know, what's old is new again. There's no answer still, which is yeah. a perfectly fine answer for this session, right? It's like, hey, you know, there's nothing new. There's no magic bullet. There's no, you know, nobody's come up with a great solution to it. Uh, it's the it's the tried and true. Still has to be done there. That's great. Um, Brian, you had mentioned when we talked yesterday, and I, I don't know if I wrote it down correctly, and, and I'd never heard the term before. You talked about um, Facebook AC, ACS. Um, yep. is the is the idea that um, or the functionality in Facebook where they can do some um, attribution on their side. Can you talk through that before we I want to move we're gonna move on to something else and I, but this is a good one. And I don't know if it's if I don't know if the functionality is good or used or you know if it's uh, if it replaces a marketing automation tool doesn't come close to one, um, but it was interesting when you described it so. Yeah, so the ACS campaign doesn't really replace uh, functionality of like an attribution tool. And we all know that Facebook's attribution right now is definitely a little wonky. It's usually overinflated at times. It's it's model data. It's never, you know, I believe now it's like they, they take it from the time the impression was served as opposed to like the time they converted or vice versa. So very murky water still. What ACS is, is basically more of a campaign structure. So basically what you're saying is, you know, we're gonna dig, we're gonna double down on Facebook's machine learning and AI, all the data that they do have and let them do a lot of the heavy work. So instead of having five campaigns um, for four different products and then five ad sets in those campaigns and then 10 ads each, you're basically saying, here's Facebook, here are our top ads, here are 50 ads, here are 20 ads, one audience going really broad and letting Facebook attack it. And on the plus size, 
on the plus side of things, obviously it gives us a lot less to manage. We don't mm -hmm. have to go into every single ad or ad set and make you know optimizations on a daily or weekly basis. But you also have to trust that you believe in what Facebook believes in, which is their tool, their data powerhouse is better than you. The AI is better than a human. And if you're willing to kind of accept that, then you know we've seen really good results with it so far. I think the issue comes is it's a beta right now and it's only out to like 10% of people. So if only 10% of advertisers are using it and getting good results. What happens when it's available to 100% and we're all bidding in those same audiences? Like, is it really gonna be that effective? Or is mm -hmm. Facebook just giving the beta users you know, of a golden audience and then when everyone gets it, they're all we're all fighting over it and rising costs all over the board. Do they give you good data at the end of it or is it a black box? It's the same data that you would get in any other campaign. You know, they track everything on platform. They're tracking, right? Your CPCs, your click-through rates, your video views, et cetera. That's their first party data, I guess, right? Um, but anything conversion-based, once they leave Facebook and go to your site, that's really where the attribution tools come in, where we need that picture um, painted a lot more clearly than relying on, oh, Facebook said we had 200 orders this week. You know, it, it was really 180 or really it was tw uh, 220. That, yeah. that difference in 20% being 15, 20, 25% off can, is make it break it for a lot of small brands. And for big brands, when you're doing mass scale and massive amounts of revenue, that number is huge. 20% of your orders could be 10,000 orders. So I absolutely re recommend, um, you know, you have to have an attribution tool. There's no reason not to. The benefits are outweigh the, you know, the cons if there are any. And it's, I think it's an absolute must in this, in this era of advertising. Alex, I'm going to move to you for 2023, but before we hop there, anything to add on the whole on Facebook ACS? I don't know if you do anything with it. Yeah, I've, you know, I've dabbled here and there. I haven't necessarily, yeah, it's kind of the same as what Brian said. It's, it's okay, but I share the same concerns that once it's rolled out to um, a broader audience, then we're all back on the same level playing field. So what the? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about, uh, 2021 we've talked about 2022 let's talk about 2023 and alex i'll have you take it do we know like we knew ios 14.5 was coming okay um we know how it it, it kind of shook out the way that people thought it was going to shake out maybe not as bad but certainly not um it wasn't an overblown problem anything coming up from the big tech right so any anything coming up that we know is coming that could also continue to make your job a little more difficult yeah, I don't think it's going to get easier by by way of acquiring data, but I think maybe putting a positive spin on it, it will facilitate a more um, honest and perhaps more customer focused um, approach to the marketing funnel and how we go about acquiring and, you know, hunting down customers. So yeah. Google Analytics 4 is coming out. Eventually, we know that, uh, you know, third party cookies will just be just be deprecated in general, not just for Apple, just for iPhone users. Um, I, I think that's the big one that my team has their has their sites set on. So what, um, and that one you, will be. Do you know? Sorry. Do you know the change with GA4? Like, what what is it that's changing? Um, originally, the plan like the the plan was to essentially um, deprecate as much as much personal data uh, that you could really access through the platform as possible, but replacing it with some better features such as you know a little bit better. Um, in platform attribution, which had always been somewhat lacking um, within GA itself, um, I, from what I understand, you know, it's kind of it's kind of updating here and there every week. I feel like some new info comes out. It sounds like they're maybe pushing back the full deprecation of third-party cookies as much as they can, for example. Um, but I, you know, that's the one I've got my sights set on, and I think it just comes back to that coupled with legislative changes. GDPR has been out for a while. We see stuff like CCPA coming down the pipeline. I think other states will follow suit soon. If California goes one way, uh, you might as well treat your American customers yeah. um, it, it, th that way as well. So I, I would say that the question continues to be like not to fight against the reduction in third party data, but to figure out how to move past it. It's like yeah. first party data is king. Make sure that your CRM system is on point. Make sure that you are collecting that you're getting enthusiastic and informed consent from your customers for marketing purposes. Make your mm -hmm. emails worth subscribing to. Make yeah, make make it worth it for them to be in your brand ecosystem, and they'll reward you with uh, marketable data that you're that you're permitted to use. Which is a right answer, right? I mean, that's that's what we should be doing, uh, Brian. Yeah things like um the government stuff right so uh ccpa has that had an impact on um on on what you have to do 
or what you have to work with at all or is it just just another box that gets checked and you have to yeah, yeah. honestly just make it was just another, yeah it's another box that got checked obviously like i don't think anything phases us too much anymore after ios i think that was the uh, absolute like nuke right and the other things are just little bombs sprinkled in but uh, I think once you get past iOS and, and kind of move on from and understand this is the new normal or just this is the way it is, you know, we've all made strides to adapt to it. I think we're all a lot more comfortable. I feel like I'm, at least for me, I feel way more comfortable in our advertising efforts and the data we get back now than I was eight months ago. So I think we're in a good place. It's not going to get any easier, like Alex said, but, you know, not that we're at rock bottom, but we kind of understand the climate and we're just moving forward. So, you know, CCPA and GDPR and things like that, they're going to come and they're not going anywhere. Um, but I think the one thing that I think is interesting to bring up with the whole iOS thing. So, you know, I was talking to my mom, who's a little bit out of the loop with uh, Apple and, and you know, how advertising works. You know, oh, Brian, how do you know, how do you track us? Like, how do you, you know, I saw a video. Why am I seeing it two days later? Hey, mom, you know, you have a pixel. Blah, blah. <laughs> Explain here the process. The big thing is, I think most Apple users, just regular, you know, regular people who are not advertising thought that if they opt out of tracking, they're not going to get ads anymore. Like, oh, I'm going to get less ads. That's actually completely not true. You're actually going to get probably more ads, unpersonalized ads. So now if you're a football fan and you get an ad for a Steelers jersey, you might, that might, you know, might annoy you that they know that about you, but you're not going to be mad over getting an ad for a Steelers jersey. Now you may get an ad for a toothbrush and you're like, wait, I wasn't even looking at toothbrush. So it's not, it's not negating the amount of ads you're going to be served. It's the same amount of ads. They just, they just tend to make a lot less sense now on why they're even getting hit with that ad. So I wanted to clear it up because I think that's kind of never really been talked about too much. Um, and I think the average user didn't really understand that, oh, I'm opting out of tracking. This is amazing. I'm not going to get hit with any ads on Facebook, but I scroll. No, it's not exactly what it is. It's just personalized ads. You had uh, talked about uh, the the climate, right? So government regulation, climate. What about the business climate? What about your your bosses, your you know your end users, your clients? Do they get it? Do they understand that, that things are different, or are they asking for things that you just cannot deliver anymore? You know, what's that like on the other side of the, the your plate? Uh, Alex, where have you go? Yeah, I mean, I would say, especially in the economic times we are living in right now, um, every sale counts. I think that, uh, you know, in my previous role, but also like with the, with the customers we see now, there's just a, a very heavy focus on your existing customer base. How do you maximize their lifetime value? How do you make sure that they're, you're delivering something that will keep them coming back for more? Um, because it's just that much easier in a time when people are maybe pulling back a bit on making purchase decisions to focus on your existing customers at hand. But with that, again, comes back to first party data. You get a better and better understanding of what looks what a successful customer for your brand looks like. Um, all the more reason to get a marketing attribution platform, look back further, understand where these customers who are making these purchases, who are maxing out their LTV um, are, are coming from. Maybe there's a pattern there. Maybe there's a, a sense of which campaigns are working really well for them. Um, and I, I would just say being able to attribute every possible lead back to a channel, back to a campaign counts. That's really my job is really showing, knitting together the work that the team does to set up our brand by way of awareness um, and selecting the product and then and tracing it all the way down to what value they're driving on the bottom line. So you mentioned, um, I'm actually gonna go back to the platforms for a second because I thought of something while you just um, mentioning the the automation platforms you had mentioned in an earlier answer that um you know put in radio spots you know put in a bunch of data into the platform are these plug and play platforms or is this i sign up and i'm done um or does it take a, a fair amount of work to get it set up and configured so that it's useful for you guys i'm gonna have both of you answer that but alex why don't you uh why don't you start sure it listen be, um, it doesn't have to be about leads on x or north beam right just in general yeah, for sure. I would say I'd say there are definitely options out there for lead RX. We make it really simple to integrate, say, like with with Salesforce, get all your customer data in there to like load in, um, you know, time logs of, of when your TV spot was running, et cetera. So when you're looking for a platform, make sure that it can it's it's comfortable with incorporating a wide variety of data. It may not all fit together perfectly well, but it gives you this it gives you this multifaceted, very rich image of, of where your marketing spend is going and then what's happening with it. OK. So if you find the right platform, yes, it should be relatively easy to do. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't had any issues either. I think it's, you know, that's kind of the, the platform is very tech. So it's very integratable and pretty easy. I mean, for the most part, there's a couple of things you might need to enter and configure, but it's pretty much a plug and play. 
Um, and it's basically just, as soon as it starts getting data from your storefront or your backend or wherever the case is pulling from, it's kind of game on. From that point on, you know, if you look back 30 days from when you integrated with it, it's pulling data from that very first moment. So yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any trouble at getting integrated. It's nothing, you know, fearful to do, or I don't know if I can do this and integrate it. You know, I'm sure the teams are there to help integrate and that's part of their job. And then once it's in there, it's game on. Great. Uh, Tom, just, you know, I'm going to do a couple more questions looking at the clock here. So, and they'll be quick ones. So if you want to gather um, any user questions. So the first one is going to be, we talked about a lot of things here, right? You're talking about big tech, you're talking about platforms, you're talking about uh, government regulations, lots of things that change uh, coming from a lot of different sources. Is there a way to stay up to date on these things? I mean, and do you guys have any tricks or you just kind of scan the headlines? Honestly, scanning the headlines is a pretty effective way to keep on top of it. Um, never underestimate the power of your network. We all know other people across the digital marketing industry. The more you can tap into them and get their perspectives, you'll get more you'll get more answers than you'll have people in the room. Um, they're you know they're kind of uncertain times, and there's more than one right way to solve the problem. So get out there, compare ideas, and have healthy conflict. I think that's what's you know worked best for me. Yeah, I rely heavily on like my Twitter. I'm a pretty uh, I'm pretty big on Twitter. The, the D2C bubble on there and kind of the space in general is a great place to again, you yeah. know, whether it's guy, you know, agencies running, you know, ads from multiple brands or CMOs or head of marketing, head acquisition, those kind of people. Just like Alex said, keeping up to date, you know, staying up to date, what's working for them might not work for you and vice versa, sharing ideas. But you know, between that and scanning the headlines, you know, these are obviously usually pretty big stories. Anything revolving big tech and privacy in this kind of day and age is going to make a headline. Does, so yeah. I don't think you're going to miss anything. Yeah. Um, we know how big the iOS stuff was, they did commercials about it. So as long as you're keeping an open eye and an open ear, I think you're, you know, you're ready for what's coming. That's perfect. All right. Last question. Um, I, I see all the time people who are stuck in what they knew five years ago, 10 years ago, right? It's just one of those things. In any industry, it doesn't matter what it is. They learned it, they they got their skill set, you know, programmers, I'm a software developer, and you got somebody that's still coding as if it's, you know, 1995, uh, with no modernization whatsoever. So let's say somebody who is watching this right now has a digital marketer, and maybe it's an agency, maybe it's their cousin's you know, X that happens to do digital marketing for them. What question would they have to ask that person or that agency or what red flag would they have to look out for to, to know that this person understands that things are different now, right? Is there, is there any simple way to kind of flush out somebody who does not pay attention to this and is just trying to plod through the exact same stuff they were doing five years ago? And I don't know. This, this is a question last minute, you know? That's a very good question. I'm, I'm thinking. I think I'll go first and then I'll let Alex take some more time to think. I'll kind of wing it. I think, you know, if you're running a, you know, if you're running a business and you're on multiple channels and if the advertiser or the marketer or the, or the agency team isn't asking for a holistic P&L or holistic true total of orders and they're just giving you what Facebook reported or this is what we saw from Google, that's a major red flag. I like that. Um, and, yeah. and I think that's a big one because the, the truest form is what is in your storefront, whether you're on a bias or a Shopify or a Magento, whatever the case may be, you can't have more orders that's that on Facebook than actually happen. So if they're not digging in the trenches and trying to figure out, all right, what are the real numbers in the back end of your system? How do I kind of compare it to what we're seeing on the front end of some of these ad platforms? If they're not, if they're not doing that and they're just feeding you what Facebook's feeding them, yeah. I think that's a, that's a pretty big red flag. That's a really good one. All right, Alex, beat that. Oh, that's going to be <laughs> tough. Um, so I'll start out by hijacking that answer and saying, you know, if they're talking it, exactly that, if it, if it's a, if it's too much on the in-platform data side, if you're if you're always talking nothing but impressions and views and reach, uh, then that's not doing anything for your business. Like, find you somebody who is intent and demands your support in digging all the way down to the level of conversion or even all the way through to customer lifetime value. Um, that's They're asking the real questions about how am I helping you invest your money wisely. On the other hand, be careful of people who deal in absolutes. Um, even with the best possible attribution set up, there's always gonna be ambiguity. This is the world we live in now. Attribution is meant to give you a lens into it and it will give you most of it, but we have to be comfortable as marketers with an element of uncertainty and and shooting from the hip. So. Anyone who's, who's going to tell you, I can track every single touch point and tell you conclusively, like force rank all your channels, um, it, 
is basically, I, I don't want to say lying. Okay, yeah, maybe they're, they're lying. They're, they're exaggerating. Lying. So <laughs> if they're not comfortable with being a little ambiguous and admitting when they don't know, um, then they're, you know, they've got a bridge to sell you. That's all there is to it. Another good answer, man. I'm going to call that a draw. That was really good. Um, any questions I missed? Anything else that you guys uh, thought of? Or are we going to hand it over to Tom? No, I don't think so. That was great. You guys did great. Tom, are you still around? Uh, yeah, I'm right here. Well done, guys. Um, drew a few questions in. Um, may some may have been touched on in some way, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll give the respect to the questions where they came from. Um, first one: What's the most challenging big digital publisher to work with on attribution, and why? <laughs> Not controversial at all. You guys want to shut off your video, change your name, and <laughs> we'll, change, we'll change the voice. Tell you what, do you want to put your answer in chat and I'll read it and I won't say who said it? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I would say TikTok, like TikTok is tough because you, TikTok is different, both in such a departure from the way that social media is being traditionally consumed, but then also as Brian was alluding to, just the in-app metrics don't really like, don't do it justice. It gives you a completely different picture than when you line it up, you know, properly through an attribution platform. Um, listen, I, I, sorry. And not always to their benefit. It's not like they're trying to, their to help them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Keep going. That's sorry. The confounding thing with it, right? Um, I would also say, I mean, I don't know if Amazon would count under that question. I'll, I'll count it. I just think that continuing to, to wall off is, yeah, they absolutely have the power to, but uh, it, it certainly doesn't make it any easier for you as a marketer. So uh, that one's super frustrating to me personally. Yeah, I think those are would be my same answers for the very similar reasons. And to your point, Greg, TikTok, if it was the other way around and they were over-reporting and trying to make their ad platform look way better to attract more advertisers, that's one thing. But they're literally lose, like they're under-reporting like pretty badly. So you know, it's not so them, weird. You, yeah, not trying to trick you. They're actually can't seem to figure it out. And that's why one of these software platforms that can collect data in a different POV is, is crucial. Great answers. Great. Um, next one, is there anything on the horizon from a technology perspective that you're excited about or have pinpointed to test when you have a chance? Oof. Honestly, I, I'll, I'll go first real quick. I think I think the attribution platforms are still so new and they're developing so much. Like when we first got, you know, integrated with Northbeam, it only had, you know, three or four functions as that, you know, time has went on and their ability of, for tech is to grow and kind of master their product to the customer. We've gotten more things. Now there's a cash flow management section. Now there's a finance section. Um, it's, you know, doing spitting out MER for you and margins and all these other things that maybe a super metric used to do. So, just growing with those that tech is so early for them still, and the amount of stuff that they're able to do and compile and make my, our job easier on the business side is is encouraging. And I think as time goes on and these data issues don't go anywhere, if anything, they get worse. These platforms are going to continue to build, um, grow their use case, and it's exciting that you know it seems like every other month or two there's something added to the platform that makes it useful. Yeah, honestly, I would say just just pushing it as far as you can from an attribution perspective. We used to measure not that many years ago, just to the point of conversion. Um, then, you know, mapping out lifetime value. Just to, some companies, if you can if you can get the right combo of data into your platform to drive all the way down to like the P and L level, then you've got it made. That's exciting, and then you've got a fully you know a fully connected model that will really help you drive marketing like you know the the engine it really is. Great, great. Um, next one, is the U.S. ahead or behind the international marketplace when it comes to the relationship of attribution and privacy rules and regulations? I think they're behind, but they're catching up. Um, and it's interesting um, in that it's actually coming up from the states. And you'll see states like California, like Illinois, like New York, um, or even like Texas kind of wading into the fray. In, in different directions with their own legislators take on things. So in some ways, it's actually kind of similar to watching the EU and GDPR, um, except a little more um, disparate across the subnational level. So I'd say they're catching up, but I think that uh, what we've seen with the states a lot is once they get on it, like they play for keeps. So I think that, that that landscape will really evolve over the next couple of years. 
and it's inevitable, I think is the other half of that, right? It it's, you know, at some yeah. point, what I heard a, a client say recently was that, um, you know, once there's CCPA and then once they found out there was a few more states starting their own, they're like, just pick the strictest one and go national with yep. it as a platform, right? As a, as a brand, you know, you can't have, you can't have a bunch of different, you know, 50 different rules based on, on, you know, where people are, are ordering from. So just pick the strictest one. And we're going to say that across the board for everybody. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, to follow up there. I think obviously the lack of a federal data privacy standard creates that vacuum where CCPA is kind of backfilled. Now these other states are, are coming in and, and, and making their own play seems like the likelihood of a federal data privacy statute probably got a little bit less in the last week. Um, any thoughts there on, on that? Do you desire that? Are you against that just for simplicity's sake or, or what? Hmm, I, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm, uh, I'm with it or against it. I mean, I think it is what it is at this point. Obviously, as a marketer in a business, I want the most data I can get, but I also understand that you know people are more and more protective over their privacy and rightfully so. Um, and I think, listen, the, the thing you have to remind yourself when you're in, you know, D2C or CPG or things like that, and you're doing a lot of advertising is whenever they unrele release these things, it's not just against us. We're all swimming in the same ocean. It's not like, you know, Nike got hit with it and Adidas didn't. It's like we're all battling the same thing. Same thing with iOS. So just taking a step back, not really getting overwhelmed by it. Hey, if we're dealing with it, our competitors are dealing with it and their competitors are dealing with it. So we're all kind of, you know, swimming down the same river. It's not a this or that thing, and we're just going to have to embrace it. And just like we did with iOS 14, you, you kind of figure out a way to move on and move forward. Yeah, I would just want a level playing field, and, you know, that's what we're getting. And if, you know, maybe this is too optimistic a note on it, but I do think it, it's going to force us to be better marketers, to be more responsive to what customers are actually looking for out there. So if that's the case, then, you know, we'll go through it and we'll get better. Hey, um, we'll wedge in one last one here. Um, let's get a little creative. If money and resources were no object, what one thing would you invest in today to improve your attribution modeling? I know what they're going to answer. Go. <laughs> you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go for it, I mean, I'll, I'll answer for them, but then they can elaborate. It's, it has go to be. A, it. <laughs> I mean, there's no question. It's uh, it, it has to be a marketing automation tool. Am I wrong? No. <laughs> yeah. because if money and time aren't an issue right that means you're you know you're spending money which means you're going across multiple platforms which means or multiple channels which means you you have to have that yeah and i think the good thing is they're really not that expensive i mean um you know based on just the you know triple whale i'm sure leads are x north beam some other ones like they're manageable they're trying to you know they're for the client they're trying to help the client grow their business so they're manageable from, manageable from a financial standpoint and the, and the perks that they bring actually frees up your team to do other things and focus on other things that maybe they didn't have the you know liberty of doing before the tool. So that's why I said there's no reason not to have one. It's an absolute no brainer. Um, there's no cons to it. It's only pros and anything like that. Whenever you're getting only pros from something, I think it's an absolute. And to, to kind of reinforce that, when we spoke on Wednesday for the first time as a group and I had a list of questions, marketing automation tools was nowhere in it. I mean, it wasn't on my radar at all. It only came up because they kept bringing it up over and over and over as they were talking about what they were doing and how they were solving some of these problems. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's an interesting development, right? An important development is probably a better way to say that. Yeah, agreed. Well, great. Let me rejoin you guys here. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. Thank you to Greg and the e-commerce council for pulling the event together today. We appreciate it. If you're a PDMI member out there and would like to get involved in creating webinars like these, you can reach out to me directly to share interest in the e-commerce council or any of the other four councils that we host today. Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is the next edition of Take 20, our bi-monthly 20-minute webinar series created by the PDMI's Brand Response Council. That event is set for Wednesday, November 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and we'll take a look at the state of uh, direct consumer media marketing or the media marketplace as we look ahead to 2023. To register for that webinar, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Also, registration and hotel reservations are now open for PDMI East. Our next in-person event slated for March 20th through 22nd, 2023 at Eden Rock, Miami Beach. Now through December 31st, you can save $100 on your event badge 
paying 2022 prices for our first 2023 event. Don't miss out. Visit the pdmi.com slash pdmi ease for more information. Thank you again for joining us today. We'd like to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye.